right. Um, I'm going to call every call this meeting to order. Uh, my name is uh, Jim Nash. I am the chair of the Parking and Transportation Commission. Um, this is the March 19th meeting, and uh, this meeting is being both audio and video recorded. Um, it's right back over there. Um, and now I'd like to go around and have people introduce themselves. So my left is? Kulalee Shara, Ward 4 City Councilor and Vice Chair. Alan Burris, I'm on the uh, planning board. Gary Hartwell, Citizen. Dave Palmer, as Director of Central Services. Adam Nova, Citizen. Queen Titan, Director of Planning and Sustainability. Nancy Forrestal, Assistant City Collector and Parking Enforcement Administrator. Maggie Shan, Department of Public Works. Devin Bruce, Citizen. Beth Cat Lewis, DPW. Thank you, everybody. Um, also, uh, Chief Casper is, is on her way and should be here soon. And uh, Director Lascalia is not going to be with us today. Um, and um, I was advised of that like a month ago. So um, let's see. So um, usually this point is for public comment, but I've moved this up in, in, in the agenda just to plug the pace car program. Just about everybody who comes here wants to talk about how to lower traffic speeds and one of the ways to do that. Oh, thank you. I left mine in the car. I was going <laughs> to. Oh. You haven't gotten your pace car sticker I yet? I haven't, Kelsey well, Nash. How do I do that? Well, if you <laughs> sign, all you need to do is go on uh, the city website, go to DPW, and, and look for the link that says the pace car program, and you can sign up. Sounds like you've already done that. I did. Okay, so what you can then do is go out to DPW and uh, you know go to the desk there, and they'll provide you with one of those lovely stickers. Excellent, thank you. How about a testimonial for how it's changed your life? Well, I will say this. I actually have one for today. I actually put my pace car sticker on my car finally yesterday. I have to say, it's a really hard thing to do. I have a speedy little car and, you know, that, you know, that, um, There's a problem. That's a problem. That's, that's a problem. Hard, it's and, <laughs> <laughs> but it's all to say that, you know, that committing to driving the speed limit, you know, that, uh, that I've, I've heard this from a number of people that, well, does this mean I have to drive the speed limit in Williamsburg? Do I have to drive the speed limit on 91? And it's like, you know what, it, it, it's, it's a pledge, and especially to drive the speed limit in Northampton, and we hope that everybody does it everywhere. So, all right, that's the shameless pace car plug. Now, on to public comment. Uh, is there anybody here who'd like to speak to a particular item? And also to let you know that if you're speaking to something that's on the agenda, you can also ask questions at that time, but if, be, feel free to come up and make a comment. And um, your I'm name Joan and Marvel, and I live at 47 Chestnut Street. <coughs> Do I need to sign up too? Uh, no. no. So I have one thing, two, an interest in two things on the agenda that I'm going to comment Excuse on me. now. Um, but the, what I initially came here for is I'm really hoping that's tucked in the agenda that I'm going to hear today an update on the status of the street lining policy, um, and especially when. It's, we're going to hear more about it with the reminder that those of us who live at that part of Chestnut Street near the Pie Bar have been asking for two and a half years for some relief from the city and things just keep getting delayed and delayed and delayed. Um, and so I'm hoping that there's going to be some kind of timely answer for us soon. Um, I just want to say since I am a bus rider and uh, rely on the 42 and 44. I was interested to see what the, that you have that on the agenda and I haven't seen what the proposed change is. But I don't want you to say for a long time that I feel like everyone who makes a decision regarding the roots of the PVTA should commit for a week to try to carry out their schedule using the PVTA. And I doubt that you'll be able to do it, but at least to plan your week and try to see what it would be like if you were, did have to use the roots of the PBTA. I mean, right now in Florence on Sundays, we basically can't go anywhere. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it really affects our lives. 
Um, and the other is just something I'm confused about. I looked at the changes about the parking on Main Street and the map, and I don't at all, maybe I'm not understanding what the green and red lines mean, but um, I don't understand at all how the entrance to the Cooper's parking lot, that tiny bit of space to the left of it, and curving around onto Wilder and curving around coming back onto me are green lines. And you know, they, those seem to me to not be places that people should ever park. Um, and so I just, I don't, you know, maybe it's my not understanding what that map means, but um, that's my question. Those are my top three. Would you spell your name so we get W W E I G E L E. Thank you, ma'am. First name, Joe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Welcome. Yeah. Marsha Holden, 22 East Street. And I'm here um, partially in response, uh, Councillor Nash and Councillor Sarah, you remember a barrage of postcards that you got at one point about pedestrian safety. So I'm now representing this group that, um, so about eight to 10 people with whom I meet every week to write political postcards, and it's usually to state and US people, you know, but one of the people in the group was very good friends with the individual who was killed um, down in East Hampton, and that got us thinking about pedestrian safety. So I just wanted to, I'm representing them, and I just want to let you know what we discussed, um, what we view as some pretty serious problems, and also I just <coughs> want you to know I'm, I'm looking at this from the point of view of someone who's getting older, and um, walking is really important exercise that most older people you know, can access easily as long as the sidewalks aren't snow covered and thus dangerous. I want to point out, I happen to live in the South Street neighborhood and South Street obviously is a really important sidewalk for people to walk down to get from you know, where I am and beyond uh, into town. Um, I personally, I don't understand what happens at the bridge across from the McCormick apartments. It seems to me like even if people take care of the sidewalks in front of their homes, isn't that bridge sidewalk that the city is responsible for? <coughs> so I could walk up to that and then have to hop into the street. So that right there in you know, pedestrian safety is pretty obvious. I also have to walk by, it's the property that Smith College owns, the um, family housing up on the, if you head in that direction, up on the left. There, I'm assuming that they're responsible for the sidewalk in front of their housing. And I will tell you, if you looked at that sidewalk in comparison to the internal sidewalks, there's a world of difference. So I don't know what happens there. They seem to take care of what's inside, but they don't take care of what's outside. They'll do the first go through, but after that, it's anyone's game and it's really dangerous. So there again, people are needing to walk. And then in that case, they can go into the bike lane. Another big problem is down from the library. As you're heading from the library towards town, that curve is really dangerous. And several times I've had to go into that street. So that's, you know, snow is, is a problem. Another problem is, you know, in Maine, and I'm, I'm also sure that I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't already know, but I guess I want it on the record. <coughs> in Main Street, where we have those crosswalks, there's, there are cars parked usually, and it's very, it's kind of scary sometimes to go out because cars, and especially, you know, cars that are visiting, we want people to come from out of town to Northampton, and people who are visiting are not always so informed about our zebra striping and that they're supposed to stop. So there's something about having these blind spots that I think is really a problem. A big one is in front of Pulaski Park because the buses pull up there and the crosswalk is after the buses. So it's very hard when you're driving to anticipate you know, that there, there might be somebody <coughs> crossing. So I think that these blind spots that exist are really difficult. 
I was driving on, um, it's not Main Street, but Route 116 into Amherst and then into where Amherst College is. And there it's the most amazing, I really would recommend you go there if you haven't seen it. But as you go right past the common, right at the common, the college is on your left. And I saw the student come up to the crosswalk that was zebra striped. And all of a sudden, these lights started flashing. I mean, it was really obvious that there was someone who needed to cross the crosswalk. Just like we have a really pretty good system up by the um, senior center and the public housing there, that's a good, you know, we know when someone has come there. So I don't, I don't know what it takes to install these kinds of lights at crosswalks, but I think it would be really helpful and maybe prevent something that's just waiting to happen. And last, there is a problem, I think a pretty big problem as you're coming, again, as you're coming down Elm Street towards the center of town, you know that traffic light at um, Route 10, there are green arrows going forward and there's, there's nothing that says you can turn right or that you can't turn right. There is an arrow, I know, there's a green arrow that says you can turn, but when those, when the lights are just going, with the arrow going straight, there's nothing that tells you either don't turn right or, or do it with, I, I think it's actually too scared to do it with caution. The, um, cross, the crossing is allowed at that time. You know, we can manage to turn right after we make sure there's no one in the crosswalk, but it can be really confusing, I think. So Those be, are my three things. To, to be clear, so you're talking about, because it's a confusing intersection where 10 and 9 and New South and so, yeah. so you're talking about where pedestrians are crossing diagonally across the street no. or more up towards Smith? Sorry. So I'm on Route 9 and right I'm headed towards, <laughs> and on the right hand side is, um, well, Caddy Corner for me is the Academy of Music. Okay. And there's just that, you have to cross Route 10 there. Got it? And that's, that's the place. I think that right turn onto Route 10 onto South Street is really tricky. It's, it's, just, it's very confusing. Okay. Thank you for sharing, okay. and uh, I can speak for all the city yeah. council. We appreciate the postcards. <laughs> I'm sure you all know those things anyway. <laughs> I'll be in touch with you, Marcia, about the snow removal. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Is there anybody else? <coughs> okay. Um, let's see. Uh, we have, uh, would somebody like to make a motion to approve the minutes from our January 15th meeting? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Any no's? Okay, it passes unanimously. <coughs> uh, are there any reports from uh, departments or subcommittees? A report from DPW. So for ra uh, roadway improvement projects, the Burt's Pit Road Improvements Project has been awarded to Palmer Paving for approximately $1.4 million. This project includes repaving approximately 1.7 miles of roadway from Clement Street to Flor Flores Island Drive. This project is expected to commence in the spring. Bids will be open for the Bridge Road and Glendale Road paving project on March 27th next week. This project includes repaving approximately 2.4 miles of roadway, uh, curb work, and drainage improvements. And the DPW is also working on plans and specifications for Spring Street from Florence Road to Meadow Street and Colga Valley Lane to Dimmick Street. This project is expected to bid in the spring. And then there's also the Jackson Street signal upgrades. We have Fagel Electrical Construction Corp um, installing a new traffic signal mask arm and signal heads this week at Bridge Road and Jackson Street. May you for an explanation? Oh, the round up. Oh, yes. Um, I don't know when that's starting. Do you have the information? Um, 
Um, so the Exit 19 roundabout, that's a state-funded project that is going to be starting. They do pre-construction stuff in April. I'm not sure when they actually, when they actually see the change. But. Okay, so this, this year we'll be seeing some work at Exit 19 for the roundabout. So that means that the project is now imminent. Yes. All right. Thank you. Any Question. other? <coughs> um, are there any plans for Chesterfield Road going out of Northampton? Past Kennedy Road? Uh, I, I haven't heard of any plans to address that at this time. Um, yeah, it's barely passable even in a car, let alone a bicycle. A few updates. Please. Thank you. So um, we had our kickoff meeting today. So Main Street. This is a you know six to ten year process. Nothing's going to happen quickly. But we be, we met with the engineers today. So we're beginning a, a total redesign of Main Street. Um, this is you know eventually a ten million dollar project through downtown. Sort of think about what we did on Pleasant Street last year on steroids. So probably dropping one travel lane and adding bike lanes and sort of truly making it more pedestrian friendly. The goal is how do we make it more pedestrian, bicycle friendly, more street tree friendly without limiting our throughput of, of cars through there. So long process. I'm sure we'll be talking about this a lot over the next few years. It's probably six year design process. Um, it's actually related somehow to the state hospital because all the work we did at the state hospital, we got um, a grant from the state to make up for encouraging development there. And so the mayor's approved using that money as traffic mitigation for Main Street because we'll be adding traffic on Main Street that comes from. Um, Valley Bike, you'd be the stations are popping up again for the spring, so we expect to Valley Bike will open on or about April 1st. We plan to add one additional, we have 14 stations in town. We plan to add one additional station on Con Street. That's going to be delayed a little bit because we have to pour concrete, but probably, that's probably about July 1st. Um, we held our public hearing on the Rocky Hill Greenway, which is the bike path from Route 10 to Route 66, and we got a program for construction in 2021. Um, that means it gets advertised, it might actually get built in 2022. And then we're going through the permit process now for continuation of that path through Burt's Bog. And we expect to start building that this summer and completion in, in the spring. Um, we just were notified that we applied for what's called to School for Bridge Street School, which would be improving um, basically by a pedestrian safety near the school. And so we're advancing the stage. This is a nice one. Usually the city pays for design and the state builds it. In this case, the state pays for both design and construction. So the exact scope can be worked out. Um, uh, I think that's, that's the main ones. <coughs> Thank you, Director. Wayne, who's the engineering firm for Main Street? Tool Design is the primary. Thank you. Actually, remember you came on a safety study. They were the ones who, were, who did that work three or four years ago. Any other updates? Okay. Um, Can I ask a question? So sure. that's all of the updates and the status of the line striping policy is not on your agenda. And it's was not, it's covered not on the agenda and I am um, in discussions with Director Lascalia around what that should look like. We talked about it at our last meeting um, and that um, I can tell you something will be coming forward. Can you tell us when? I can't do that. Um, but I, I anticipate it um, sometime in the near future. You can say it will be on the agenda when it's coming forward for the meeting. There you go. We, we were told that over the winter the policy would be developed. And I think spring is here. I, I, I understand that. So the, the topic has come up between uh, myself and direct, Director Lascalia, and we're figuring out how to bring that, um, that, that policy forward. Is there anything that we can do to help you move it along? <laughs> uh, your presence here today and speaking <laughs> the way you are is helping. <laughs> well, we've been doing this for like, what, three years? Just not before you were here <laughs> so you know i just wonder how many town meetings 
we have to come to before anything is going to happen. Like even the sign we talked about last time, the no parking sign never got moved. So <laughs> I thought we talked about that last time. Did they say they were going to do that? I'm glad I was happy. I mean, I could well, so I, my recommendation here is if you have a specific thing that you would like to see, that you contact your counselor, and I believe in that area it's uh, Counselor Murphy, and that he can, he can develop a specific proposal that then can be submitted to us. What you're talking about is an overall line striking policy for how we would approach that particular um, uh, section of the city. What this committee was talking about was an overall policy. We were talking about some really specific line striping that we wanted done. Right. And the committee's response was it can't be done without developing a whole policy right. for the city. And Correct. you had told us that you and Councillor Murphy had already walked the area and agreed on the problems and some some things that regarding signage that were already wrong that could be addressed but nothing's happening so we were offered lines the first meeting we came to three years ago but it was too cold so they didn't do it and now we're being told like we can't do <coughs> lines because there's no policy but you know a few streets over in middle street they put parking spots in when there was a problem like this years ago so I'm just not understanding why all of a sudden there's no policy to do this on our street. It doesn't really make any sense to me. They put signs up about, you know, parking limits, time limits, and parking spots on Middle Street. So um, I'm going to advise that you speak with Councillor Murphy around coming up with a specific proposal. I'm more than happy to talk to you, either of you, after the meeting. Um, I'm supportive of the concept, and I think a lot of people are here as well. We just, we need to have the policy matching up with the actual ordinance, so it actually goes forward in a proper manner. One of the things that we spend a lot of time addressing has to do with that there's been do things done inconsistently in the past where people will come to us and say, this used to be a no parking zone where the sign go. Well, it was never a no parking zone. Somebody just put a sign up. So there's a lot of cleaning up that we're tending to. Um, and I don't want to cut you off, and I, but I need to to get back to the meeting here. But I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, you, you can reach me through my email, and I <coughs> recommend talking to Councilor Murphy as well. I mean, and I'm it just going to say that it it's just frustrating that I feel like we're beyond, back further than we were at the end of a meeting in the fall when we were promised that the policy would be developed over the winter because in the fall it was said, well, it's going to be too cold now anyway, so over we'll have it ready to go for the spring. And it doesn't even sound like the specifics of a policy have been discussed and there's no timeline for it. And I just find that really frustrating. It's just a I, I hear you. And, um, and I'm more than happy to talk about this outside the meeting. So, um, so I'm going to move on with the next thing on the agenda. We are to the uh, PVTA presentation. Thank you. I think if you hit Control F5, it should go full screen. So I'd like to welcome Price Armstrong, who's with the PVTA. Uh, he's here today to give us an update on uh, ridership in uh, Northampton and uh, surrounding communities, and also to discuss a few other concept ideas. Yeah, so thank you and you have the floor thank you councilor nash for uh, inviting us here today before i uh, go any further i just want to introduce some <coughs> colleagues alex forrest from the planning commission he's a transit planner um very knowledgeable about bus stops and transit and then jamin carroll who's the director of operations for vatco valley area transit which serves northampton and also extremely knowledgeable about uh the uh the service here 
because you used to drive buses here, didn't you? I did. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll also say that I'm really glad to be here because I realized uh, when Adam Novit introduced himself, he and I corresponded like over a decade ago about Bike Week 2008 uh, oh, screening okay. in the Forbes Library. I was the Bike Week coordinator back then. Right. Yeah, when I was a fresh-faced, doughy-eyed, like 22-year-old, um, <laughs> looking to promote biking and uh, well, and walking in Northampton. So very glad to be back here. Um, and I'll, final note, this uh, went from a PowerPoint to a Google uh, presentation, and I can already tell that the formatting is a little bit off, so if anything uh, wonky happens, I'm blaming technology and not, not my PowerPoint acumen. Um, hopefully nothing too weird happened. Uh, but if you could advance the slide, please. So first I just wanted to give an overview of the bus routes that we serve here in Northampton. Um, uh, we uh, have the 39 uh, and the 39E, which serve Smith, Hampshire College, and the 39 actually starts at Mount Holyoke. Uh, then we've got the R41, which goes North Hampton, East Hampton, Holyoke Community College. Uh, R42 comes from Williamsburg, and I think it turns into the 41, doesn't it? Right, at the Academy of Music. Uh, the 43, that's a, that's a big route um, that carries a lot of passengers. It has articulated buses, which is relevant later on. But that's the one that travels along Route 9 between Northampton and Amherst and serves uh, from Smith College to uh, the um, Hampshire Mall, UMass Amherst, and then uh, Amherst Center. The 44, which we're going to talk about in some detail, uh, that's kind of horseshoe shaped and it goes from Florence along uh, King Street, the commercial area there, all the way around to uh, to the jail. And then finally, the oh, well, not finally, sorry, then the B48 that basically goes from uh, downtown Holyoke to downtown Northampton along Route 5. Uh, the Nashawanic Express is a, is a shuttle that goes from Northampton uh, and serves East Hampton. And then finally, there's the Northampton Survival Center shuttle, which replaced the X98, and that uh, runs four times a day serving um, trips between the Academy of Music and the Survival Center. So if you could um, move it forward. And I would also say, like, feel free to keep it fairly informal. If you have questions, just interrupt me. And I'm, I'm happy to answer, or barring that, look to smarter people to answer the question. Or barring that, answer the question later on once we dig around and find the answer. I just wanted to show a, uh, a pictorial representation of what the routes look like. Uh, Northampton is one of a few nodes in the Pioneer Valley where you have basically like UMass Amherst as a node, uh, Northampton, Holyoke, and Springfield. Um, and so Northampton, uh, uh, not all roads lead to Northampton, but many of them do. Um, and if you, yeah. So uh, Chris, this, yeah. Can you go back to that one slide? Yeah. This, 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 go, this doesn't cover all the routes, right? Hampshire Heights, Florence Heights isn't on there, and the jail isn't on there. Yeah, I, I thought somebody with a discerning eye might uh, notice this. Okay. So this was using a, um, an online platform called Remix, and so it leaves out some of the details. It's what we call like root, de not root deviations, root patterns. So this leaves out a little bit of that detail, but we'll show the map later on of the R44. This is like a general outline of what the, what the service looks like. So in terms of talking about ridership trends, I'm gonna start at the system-wide and then move to the um, Northampton specifically. Overall system-wide, we've seen ridership decline. And that's not just here in the Pioneer Valley. Um, nationally, with a few exceptions, ridership is going down. There's actually been a lot of research uh, about why is ridership going down. Um, the economy is pretty good, so people can afford to drive. Uh, and so if you look at vehicle miles traveled nationally, since uh, for the first time since um, the recession, we're seeing total vehicle miles, uh, sorry, per capita vehicle miles traveled, I, both, uh, increase for the first time. And so you, you see a commensurate decline generally in, uh, in ridership. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, and I'm sorry, this is a little bit small, but um, but you can see here in the North Air, uh, Northampton area, it's uh, the same thing. We're we're seeing declines in ridership, although um, <coughs> we're not seeing too much of a of a dip from FY19. Uh, sorry, from FY18 to FY19. But overall, the trend is going down. 2016 is the red, 2017 is the gray, and it's sort of like ticking down. Overall, I think we're see we've seen system-wide about a, five, a four or five percent decline in ridership year to date. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. One thing to keep in mind for the Pioneer Valley service area specifically, aside from these sort of like macro trends of low gas prices, um, the economy is doing well so people can afford to buy cars, 
Um, we've also been, as you probably know, we've reduced service two years in a row and also increased fares. So uh, this is the vehicle revenue hours um, year to date, so July through January, the fiscal year runs July through January. And you can see each of the um, past two years relative to FY17, we've seen a decline in, um, in our vehicle revenue hours. Um, so in general, when you look at ridership trends, they move pretty much in lockstep with uh, service trends. So um, if you have a 5% decline in the service, then you get uh, a commensurate, commensurate uh, decline in ridership. Usually it's not quite as severe as the, um, as the decline, you know, it might be like a three or 4% decline in ridership, um, but the two move in tandem, which would make sense. Uh, in terms of route by route uh, metrics, and I tried to highlight just the, um, uh, just the uh, uh, Northampton ones. This is our, we have performance standards in passengers per revenue hour. That's what that uh, third column is. Um, so the R41, R42, R44, and 39 on this slide, uh, those, are the, those are the Northampton uh, routes. And in general, um, you know, none of them make the mark every month. The R44 is certainly out of the 41, 42, and 44. That one is certainly the one where we can see the most improvement. Um, we're hoping that the service concept that we propose um, would show an increase in ridership. Uh, and then the 39, uh, that one is pretty far shy of the mark of 20 uh, passengers per revenue hour, or uh, unlinked passenger trips per revenue hour. Um, that one's tough because it, you know, it serves Mount Holyoke College, Hampshire College, and then Smith College. So it's a pretty rural area, aside from the, aside from the uh, colleges, you don't really have a lot of opportunity to pick up ridership, um, and you know, the five colleges need to have those those campuses connected. So we we run the service even if it's not hitting the, the mark that we expect. If you could um, go to the next slide, please. Oh, a slide got dropped. No, oh, that's okay. Um, uh, this might be my fault. Uh, I, this is just to say that the B43, uh, th that was the, the big slide that I wanted to, uh, sorry, the big thing on the, the slide that got dropped that I wanted to point out was just that the B43 is like an amazingly um, efficient route, especially during the school year. It's got like a 20, tr uh, 20 passengers uh, per revenue hour uh, benchmark, and during the school year we get like 30, 35 passengers per revenue hour, which is why we have the double long articulated buses with like the accordion in the middle, you know, the accordion piece in the middle. So um, just to say that that one is doing quite well. And the B48 is the one that runs between um, downtown Northampton and downtown Holyoke. That one, again, like the 39, is kind of a rough, it's kind of a difficult route because you've got a lot of, a lot of people and then not very much on Route 5 and then a lot of people, but so you don't have the opportunity to pick up a lot of people all along the way. You get a lot of revenue hours. There's a lot of sort of dead time in between, um, but it's important because it provides this regional connectivity. I mean, I would hate to see the B48 rolled back because then that's your connection between Hamden and Hampshire County. Um, so are there any questions sort of about ridership trends, uh, <coughs> service in general, before I dive into the R44? So NASTOP funded an enhanced transit study for the B43. Yes. Has any, it, do you know what PBTA is doing with that, if anything? Um, so the study hasn't been finalized yet, or if it has, it's like only just recently been released. I know that uh, one of the things that PBTA is certainly going to be doing as a product, um, right now there's no curbside uh, uh, bus stops near Hampshire Mall. So as a part of the uh, Route 9 project, like the Route 9 expansion project. They're going from two lanes to three lanes. They're going to be building bus pullouts at Hampshire Mall. So for express trips in the morning, we're not going to be deviating into the Hampshire Mall uh, <coughs> parking lot or the Walmart parking lot. We're just going to be dropping off curbside and then, and then moving along. You know, longer term, I think there's opportunity for thinking about, um, it wouldn't be so for those of you who know the term bus rapid transit, like they have in um, uh, Bogota, Colombia, where it's like, or even to, uh, to a lesser extent in Boston with like fully separated bus lanes. And you know, even when cars are sitting in traffic, the bus is sort of zooming by in their own right of way. Like we're not gonna have that. And that's not a part of the study. But I think that moving forward, MassDOT 
is committed because they have to be that transit is the future of mobility in the Route 9 corridor. The, you know, Hampshire County has one bridge over the Connecticut River. Um, nine miles in either direction, there's no bridge. Uh, MassDOT's been pretty firm within the foreseeable future, we're not building another bridge. And so that's the choke point. You can put 50 lanes on Route 9, but ultimately the choke point is the, the Coolidge Bridge. So if you're not gonna, so if capacity enhancements aren't going to be easing uh, 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 traffic congestion, then how do you fit more people? You know, how do you fit eight pounds of potatoes into a, into a six pound bag? Well, I don't know if this metaphor works, but transit. Um, so they're looking at, uh, uh, you know, queue jump lanes, transit signal priority, um, these sort of like enhanced uh, shelters like at, like at Hampshire Mall, and then off-board fare collection. Uh, these are things that are all on the table. Um, we don't have any concrete plans to implement them yet. Partially because there's, right now it's sort of like defending what we already have. <coughs> that was a very long answer, but I hope interesting. <laughs> Any other? Yeah. Uh, has the drop in ridership actually plateaued? Do you expect it? I mean, economic trends, you're going to have some rise and fall. Do you think it's gone to where it's going to go? Um, so on a very micro scale, looking at PVTA, uh, as you may or may not know, the MASA just released the RTA task force report where they were, um, the task force recommended funding at over $90 million in the, in the report. Um, my understanding is if that level of funding is allocated, then we wouldn't be reducing service. If the governor's budget is actually what is allocated, which was 86 million, then that leaves us with a $1.2 million budget deficit that we think right now we're still in the, in the budget um, development process. So it all sort of like hinges on if we have to cut service, then ridership's definitely gonna go down. Like that's the really short answer. And a lot of this has to do with the, the politics, you know, the, the, the governor and MassDOT have their take on what funding should be, the legislature has their take, and then sort of figuring out what ends up um, at the, you know, what ends up being signed into law um, will dictate a lot of what happens to ridership. Uh, macro, um, I would say that as long as gas is cheap and the economy is good, we're going to see a lot of pressure on transit generally for people who, you know, it's much more convenient if you don't have to worry about making the bus that only comes once every 20 or 30 minutes. You just hop in your car and go where you want to go. Um, so that's just kind of, kind of the reality. I think that we're going to continue seeing until we get funding to run, you know, 10 minute service, which you have in the Boston area or, um, or you know, gas prices go up, etc. Um, you know, somehow it's harder to drive. I think you're going to con continue seeing this sort of the same sort of pressure that you've seen globally on transit. Yeah. Um, you keep referring to people who can afford their cars and to pay for gas. Uh, what kind of efforts are you putting into targeting um, areas that may not have? a population that can afford to buy a car and can afford to keep that car topped up with gas. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. I, you know, when I, when we're talking about ridership trends and sort of like the macro trend of people buying cars and, you know, able to buy more gas, we're certainly talking about people who are I don't want to say on the margins, but like choice riders who like previously maybe they were choosing to ride the bus for whatever reason, maybe it was economic or maybe it was environmental or maybe it was just the schedule or whatever the case may be maybe they just like riding the bus but then it becomes easier to drive and so on the margins they sort of they move over to they move over to driving or I mean conversely I don't want to I don't want to presume maybe they're biking or walking or working from home or whatever um, in terms of uh, providing service to the what we call dependent riders so the people who um, really have no other way of making uh, the trip, which is the vast majority of our riders. You know, um, one thing that's really, um, one thing that's, uh, makes it very easy to provide a high level of service for our transit dependent population is that we see most of the very low income uh, uh, populations in the Pioneer Valley concentrated in our urban core areas. And so that's, uh, that's where you see, um, that's where you see like the B7 in downtown Springfield. It runs every 15 minutes. 
uh, the 30 and 31 in Amherst, which another low income population, stu college students, I think that runs every 20 minutes? 15. 15. Oh, every 15 minutes, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, when you think about what is it that people want, and I, one thing that I forgot to mention is that I myself am a bus rider. I ride the bus, the P21 or the P21 Express from downtown Holyoke to Springfield, and then Alex is also a bus rider. He rides the 21 Express and the 48 and probably the 43. Um, so we very much, uh, uh, in response to an earlier comment, we very much experience what it's like uh, to, to ride the bus and all of the good things about it and all of the uh, uh, opportunities for improvement. But I can say from my experience, certainly from hearing Alex talk about his experience and from the literature, you know, the big things are, how do, how do you provide better service? One is reliability. Um, uh, it's generally, it's okay if the bus runs, you know, every, 20 minutes, even every half hour. But if that half hour uh, trip, if it's 15 or 20 minutes late, then that, that really can ruin your day. It can also make you late for work, make you late to picking up your kids from daycare, you know, whatever the case may be. So reliability is huge. And also frequency is really important. I was saying earlier that um, one, of the, one of the hallmarks of like truly good bus service is you don't have to have a schedule. You know, you can just sort of like know that if you walk out to the bus stop that you know, in nine minutes or less, there's going to be a bus there. And generally that's the sweet spot that the literature has found for um, customers waiting at a bus stop. So, you know, if we can provide reliable, frequent, oh, and also span of service, I didn't talk about that, but service that runs in late in the evening and early in the morning, as the RTA task force um, report uh, 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 highlighted, um, a lot of people don't work nine to five jobs anymore. You know, they work, they work Sundays at 5 a.m. They work um, until, you know, their shift might start at 11 p.m. So these are all things that we do and uh, that we look at and think about. And especially in these times when we're looking at service reductions, we really try and look at, okay, who are our core transit dependent populations and how do we maintain to the best ex extent possible these things that make the service uh, uh, worth using. Can I just say one thing that when you keep saying 20 minutes and half an hour, both the 42 and the 44, they leave Florence at the exact same time. They, most of the time they pull up right behind each other. And if you miss them, it's an hour before there's another one. And the same thing happens with downtown. They both leave downtown at the same time. And if you miss them, it's an hour away. Yeah, I should emphasize and, most of Northampton Garage's routes operate at hourly headways. Uh, yeah. And so it's, you know, I think that, you know, that's, you know, and, and when, and the way that the 43 connects to the 42 or the 44, the timing is such that most of the 42, 43 runs get to Northampton after the 42 and the 44 have left for Florence. So you get here and you have to wait an hour to be able to get up to Florence. Unless, you know, sometimes if it's close, the driver will communicate and they'll hold the bus if it's just a couple of minutes. But most of the 43 runs are timed so that you have a long wait in Northampton before you can get to Florence. And I think the next thing you want to talk about might address that. Yeah, um, I, uh, sure. Uh, so certainly uh, <coughs> increasing frequencies I, right i was talking mostly about like urban core service but when you get out into lower density um, more like rural or suburban it's uh it's harder to you know the 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 um, if you want to back up a slide um you know we have these performance standards of like 20 passengers per revenue hour or 15 passengers per revenue hour and so this is something that's constantly a challenge is, and, and, and frankly, um, getting back to that RTA task force, you know, MassDOT is very much moving in the direction of emphasizing these kinds of performance metrics even more. Uh, you know, the question is, we're using taxpayer money, how do we demonstrate the bang for the buck for the taxpayer? And so this is one of those, one of those metrics that MassDOT is looking at. Um, how many people are you moving per revenue hour? That's how we, you know, we pay the driver per revenue hour. That's like how we how we spend money, um, and so this gets back to an issue that we are constantly thinking about and trying to strike an appropriate balance with is um, uh, serving rural and lower density areas 
in a way that both recognizes that there are severe transportation needs. You know, uh, there are certainly people who need to access medical appointments, work, school, even just the sort of quality of life services like um, uh, wow. quality of life. Sorry, I didn't mention shopping or grocery shopping, which I wouldn't call quality of life. I would also call it a lifeline service. But then even just visiting friends, going to the Academy of Music, you know, these are all very valuable trips. We certainly recognize that, but um, but in general, it's very hard to uh, um, hit those marks, hit those performance standards if you increase service a lot in a low density area because there, is, there just isn't as much travel demand. So that's just something to keep in mind as we talk about um, ways to restructure the R44 specifically. And if you could go to the next slide. Um, so this is the current R44. As I mentioned, it's kind of horseshoe shaped. It goes uh, from Florence Heights um, up to uh, the, the commercial area on King Street, uh, down to uh, the downtown area, it hits the Salvo House, and then loops around to uh, the Hampshire County House of Corrections, and then um, goes back. And it sort of like does that does that loop. Um, actually, it takes two hours for one bus to do that, um, but we have two buses running on that. I'm just, yeah. We have two buses running on that, that horseshoe right now. Um, so if you'll uh, uh, go to the next slide. Oh, and then this is the schedule, which again, I, re I realize it's very hard to read, but uh, again, weekday, the, um, the, the frequency is once every hour. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So uh, as we had referenced earlier, there was a request, uh, they're building a lot of co-housing units, and I, I think specifically there are refugee populations that are being, um, that are being placed into these co-housing units on Florence Road. Um, so that's, that was what sort of uh, started us looking at how do we restructure the R44, um, because uh, they were saying, you know, well, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't serve there at all. It's like the gap in the horseshoe. Uh, so unfortunately, we can't turn on a dime I mean, this is part of the process of looking at restructuring the route. We couldn't turn on a dime to start providing fixed route service. But, um, but one of the things, and I'm going to credit Alex for this, uh, he said, we've got two buses. What if we split the, uh, the, the horseshoe into two routes, one bus going clockwise, the other bus going counterclockwise, and so we can fill in that gap and still provide uh, uh, roughly hourly service. So that was the that was the um, the proposal. Unfortunately, when we tested out the route, uh, Jamin took uh, took a bus out um, to test it out. It we couldn't make 60 minute headways. So under this proposal, if we wanted to uh, follow the routing that we proposed, it would have to increase to 70 minute headways. And again, keeping in mind the um, budget uh, constraints that we've been operating under, and we'll likely continue to be operating under. Uh, it's probably not feasible for us to add a third bus, or actually it would have to be a fourth bus, um, to reduce down the, uh, the, the headways to something under 70 minutes. So that's something that, I, you know, really I would look to you all to think about in terms of trade-offs. You know, we would be able to fill in that gap, we would be able to have uh, a bus going, you know, each way. So in theory, if you're at any point, um, you, there would be a bus coming every hour still? Or no, no every half hour? Coming, no, it would be coming every 70 minutes in any given direction. Oh, OK. Right. In any given direction. Um, but with but two different directions, you'd have two buses coming every 70 minute period, one in each direction, basically. Right, so if you so. were trying to get on the exact opposite side of the circle, you would have a bus coming every 35 minutes that you conceivably could take. Uh, on average, depending on how, yeah. you, how you time them, yeah. Right. Um, so that you know, that's something to, to think about. You know, you it it could be an increase in the headways, but it's also a higher level of service. Does that make sense? Chris, what's the distance you use for which a reasonable distance for people to walk to a bus stop? Uh, in general, it's a quarter mile. It's considered the walk shed. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the only reason I ask is so we have a bike path from the co-housing project to Ice Pond. I don't know if there's an option of a shorter thing of just making the GL route go a little bit further west. And I also don't know if that's a quarter mile or maybe beyond, but at least it might be worth looking at that. Mm -hmm. But my, I mean, you know, it's that same thing about headway. So I, my guess is this is going to be incredibly low ridership. And I hate 
making the route that not that the route ever has high ridership, but I'd hate having diluting it even more. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I want to serve every place, but I don't want to dilute the ride. Right. So this this would represent a uh, what is it a going from hourly to seventy minute headways. Um, it'd be you know instead of suppose the bus comes along at six in the morning and then the next one will be at seven and it'll be six then seven ten then eight twenty. It'll be slightly different. Um, and it would be a longer wait, so that would probably depress ridership, but I wouldn't expect it to depress it by very much. Um, and then combined with the fact that, you know, you could now get to any point on the route in either direction, that might help cancel it out. But this is all pretty tentative right now. Can I, are you proposing a change in the map, or the map stays the same? This would involve a change in the map. Sorry. So do you have, do you have what the map would look like? Yes, yeah, if you, if you uh, progress to the next slide. Oh, you can go, keep going. So this is where it currently stops. Oh, oh where did that go? Right, because there is a housing there. There we go. So this is the, this would be the new map. Um, and, and probably it would be, we'd have to create two separate schedules. We're sort of trying to figure this out. Uh, exactly you know it'd be the r44a and the r44b or would it be like the r40 you know r50 and r51 or you know whatever whatever the case may be because the two the two routes would be relatively different actually if you go i think it maybe up one there's the um there's the timetable yeah so this is like a proposed timetable um sort of conceptual where you know the r44a as i'm calling it um you know, it'd go from 5:50 to 7:50 a.m. to 7:50 p.m. Um, running clockwise. No, I'm sorry, that's not right. Running uh, counterclockwise. I mean to say, um, and then the R44B would be running uh, clockwise. So you know, the two buses would meet every 35 minutes in the middle. Like they pass each other every 35 minutes. And so again, I go back to depending on where you want to go. It's not necessarily every 70 minutes. If you're if you're trying to get to the other end of the, if you're the, if you want to travel along the diameter of the circle, then it's conceptually it could be every 35 minutes you have a bus that you could be taking. Because it doesn't matter if you're going clockwise or counterclockwise. So, it's just something to keep in mind. And also, you're probably not going to get any ridership. The jail. And then the co-housing will be your ridership, but then all the rest of Florence Road down to Florence Heights, you're probably not going to pick up any ridership. Correct, yeah. But the, the that means it doesn't need to slow down and stop during that time. So mm -hmm. and if you if you could progress this slide one more time. Uh, no, sorry, back to the map. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, if I remember properly, the co-housing sorry, it's kind of like it's in this lower left hand corner. There are a few different um, co-housing units, if I remember properly. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, again, we didn't want to bring the bring the horseshoe even closer to touching, if that makes sense. Um, under the under the current routing, we, we thought, okay, it's going to be a lot more efficient if we just have one bus going clockwise and one bus going counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. So certainly, I, and, and to, to your point, there's just no getting around the fact that the southeast, uh, sorry, southwest section of that route is it's very low density and you're not going to pick up a whole lot of people mm -hmm. probably and i also just want to clarify something quickly which is that you know to to extend the route at all if we're if we are to provide ppta service to this co-housing area um there's no way that we can do that really without increasing the cycle time for the route it will simply take more time to cover more stops on the route the question is you know do we want to increase the time within the uh horseshoe shape or do we want to convert it to a loop um, or if we want to maintain these 60 minute headways that we currently have, we would have to just not extend the route, basically. It's a pretty tight schedule, would you say? There's a little bit of slack time, but not enough to accommodate right. additional service. And nothing else changes on the route, like going to Big Y and going to Stop and Shop, or the, that's, right, that would all stay the same. stays the same and going through Meadowbrook? Because mm -hmm. I mean, one thing about this route now is it serves Florence Heights, Meadowbrook, and Hampshire Heights, mm -hmm. and it hits both the grocery stores for everybody who lives in those places. Um, and so, I mean, it is you know that and the fact that the 42 serves the VA, they're really important routes. Yeah, yeah. So none of that would change under this proposal. 
So price. Yeah. So at this time, you guys, uh, PVTA is not recommending this, or how would you? How are you hoping to move forward to uh, come to a place where you guys are ready to propose something? So in in general. Um, how do I put it? We're here to please. So what I would recommend, my recommendation in terms of process would be, uh, we're presenting it to you guys. If you, ha if something is raising red flags or if it's like, no, this really doesn't make sense, then frankly, we would have to talk with you more about it and, uh, and get your input, um, maybe touch it up a little bit. And then the, uh, the next step, my recommendation would be we could hold a public hearing. Um, uh, work with the city to engage bus riders and other stakeholders, uh, institutional stakeholders and otherwise, to get broader input. And then assuming that you know the input is generally favorable, there aren't any sort of like um, deal breaker objections, then I would recommend that we, uh, that we do what's called a one year pilot of, of the new service. Uh, so it's very typical in transit um, where we just, we test it out. You know, again, this is, uh, an equally valid response is, this is a low density area that won't see very much ridership. We're sympathetic to the request, but the downsides are too great. We don't wanna see the, the R44 totally restructured for something that we may decide after all won't stick. Um, we, you know, we don't wanna make a change. That would be, that would be a, valid, a valid and acceptable response from my perspective, but equally valid would be, yes, this makes sense. Let's, let's give it a go. Um, you know, let's give it 12 months. And, uh, and then track progress, see what happens to the ridership. Um, after, again, going through uh, some sort of public process where we make sure that, you know, even more viewpoints, even more eyes on this proposal are, 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 are given to us. So internally, do you have a time frame that you would like to follow? Uh, so I would <laughs> defer to our director of operations. We could probably get this for the summer bid, or would it, no, fall bid? Uh, we're starting bidding on the summer next week. Okay, so we could get it for, when does your fall um, bid start? Late July, early August. Okay, so yeah, the timeline would be um, getting the new service on the street late July, early August. And uh, and then, like I said, we can just track, track what the performance is, look at the ridership, um, we can, even do a follow-up public meeting or something. I'm not crazy on public meetings because, as I'm sure everybody here knows, um, you're not necessarily going to get the people who are riding the bus to actually come to the public meeting. I mean, you certainly might, but I actually would be more interested in like going out um, to the Academy of Music and talk to people as they're getting off the bus. Like, how's this working for you? What do you think? Uh, so, you know, get more public input. And then, like I said, if it's working well, then let's keep it. So I, I, I hate being dubious, there is like better bus service, but having lived through the R44 going down Ryan Road, and then the Crosstown bus that got, what, two people per ride, and we're right. sort of worried about those rural places. But I, I, the loop is certainly appealing. But I'm sort of curious, did you ever look at or have a loop that did the big wide King Street but came back on Route 9 so you could have less, he you know, fast, shorter headway? times but still serve all those areas? So you're discussing a route which would go up King Street, serve the stop and shop there, serve the big Y there, but then come back through Damon Road and Route 9 or back through um, Florence and Route 9 that way? Florence and Route 9 that way, but again doing a loop. So one bus is going clockwise and one bus is going counterclockwise. That's plausible. It would leave out the um, the houses at Flor you know, the apartments at Florence Heights. Um, no, I, think, I think Florence Heights would be a must, but I think going as far as Florence Heights they okay, so then no service to the co-housing. Not really about the co-housing, right? I right, so leaving up the co-housing and coming back that way. Um, no, we hadn't considered that. This, this was mainly an attempt to work the co-housing into the R44 schedule. Right. Um, not, not originally an attempt to just generally improve the R44. Right. But, now, uh, I think where I come from is, I, I believe in public choice. I have no problem with people living in rural, less dense areas, mm. but I just think when people make that decision, they can't expect bus service because bus service isn't really realistic at those points. Right, I agree, but this does come back to the problem of um, you know bus service as a relief mode for people who uh, have trouble affording to drive. You know, there are people who have trouble affording to drive, but also don't live anywhere remotely useful for uh, transit service, and so they we're just sort of at a bit of an impasse with uh, okay. people in that situation. North Ham is not the only town in that boat. Many towns have that situation, and. Um, 
you know, we just have to make compromises to serve them one way or another. Yeah. And this topic came up because of the refugees that are being settled in that co-housing. Right. That's right. So they, they have little to no choice in terms of our housing. Right. Well, that's why I was curious about the option of, because mm -hmm. the way it is here, they'd still be walking <coughs> 800 feet out to Florence Road, and so I'm curious about mm -hmm. how much more is the walk going down to the jail um, with this bus service or extending out there. Mm -hmm. I can look into that uh, for an exact measurement, but I'm certainly under the impression it's a further walk through to Florence okay. Road. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the challenges of uh, of transit planning. It's, it's there is no right answer. I mean, I want to. I've probably said this. I've gotten. I, I've maybe implied this earlier, but I'll say it. Like, there is no right answer to greater coverage or greater frequency. You know, because those are kind of your trade offs. You can have a you can have a tighter uh, a tighter network where the buses are running more frequent. Or you can have a larger network, and it takes a little bit longer to, to serve those people. But I, so I was on the PDTA board when the Nelson Nygaard study came in, and it seemed mm -hmm. like there was consensus at the time that you wanted that more frequent service. So that was so. I, I'm just sort of trying to philosophically. So I, I get <laughs> yeah. that the trade-off and one's not right, yeah. but there was one clear direction PDTA was going, and so I'm just trying to rationalize what. Right. It was. I will say, from the perspective of trying to get more riders, you always want to go in favor of higher frequency. Um, it's just that that. You know, necessarily leaves out people who might need to use the bus for lack of other options, but don't live in a place that's conveniently served by the uh, higher frequency priority. Also, when the Nelson Nygaard study came out, PBTA's financial situation was very different under the uh, Patrick administration, and that has completely changed uh, with yeah. Baker. So, yeah, I mean, so if I could again, in terms of a recommendation for next steps. Um, you know, PBTA can certainly set up a, a public meeting um, where we can invite members of the public to uh, to comment on this proposal. We can also do some intervention surveys where, like I said, we hang out at the Academy of Music in a morning or an afternoon and talk to the actual users of the R44 service um, to see what their uh, to see what their take is on it. And then, um, you know, if we uh, if we don't identify any major problems, and if you guys are fine with the 70 minute headways, um, then uh, under this proposal, uh, then I would recommend that we move forward with, with testing this out. Again, yes. that said, to Wayne's point, I mean, this moves in the opposite direction of a, of a tighter, more frequent network. You know, the, the headways would, would increase, so. Can I ask one last question? I promise it'll be my last. Mm -hmm. um, I've written to the PDTA a couple of times about this and never gotten any response. Why is it not possible for the 44 and the 42 to run half an hour opposite each other instead of both coming to Florence at the same time and both leaving downtown at the I should, same time? There's nothing impossible about that. It would just mean changing the schedule, offsetting one route by half an hour. But yeah, there's, there's no physical wait, 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 wait. I'm going to defer to the director of operations on that one. Mm -hmm. The reason that they are scheduled relatively similarly is because the passengers the for the VA for come down into the center of town and then they transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, if we offset them a half an hour, then every person going to or from the VA has right. at least a half an hour added to their travel time. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So that's so that's the re the rationale behind it. Mm -hmm. Trade offs. Right, exactly. I would say, based on this conversation and probably others, that having a, some sort of public forum would really be beneficial. Okay. Um, I um, and I also suggest uh, stopping in at some of the communities along that route. Mm -hmm. uh, Florence Heights, I know, is a is a big stop, and that um, uh, speaking to them about you know uh, actually getting the actual travel times of like, hey, if you take the counterclockwise route you can get downtown in 20 minutes as opposed to 45 that that might be more appealing and you could go to di different points along the route um, okay yeah well in terms of process would you want us to um, let's see it usually takes a couple of weeks to set up any sort of public hearing because we have to advertise it uh, we could probably come back either next month or the month after. I don't know if you have a, to present our findings or do you want to informally? Oh, we'd, we'd love to hear the findings. But, and, okay. but I also think it needs to, well, this is the mayor's commission. Okay. And that um, most importantly that the information go to the mayor. Okay. Okay. All right. And then we can coordinate on what would make sense for this body moving forward. And, uh, that would be great. Okay. 
question. How do people get notified that a new route has been created? Uh, multiple ways. So one is we um, <coughs> usually put up a notice like at the, at the stop, like on the signs, we correct? We typically post notices at every stop that is affected as well as on every bus. And then of course all of our like electronic communications as well, uh, you know, social media, the website, um, I'm trying to think. We have in the past for, I know for bigger service changes, we've had people actually out there telling people. I don't know if we would do that this time around, but we would be open to it. Cause like I said, we have, we have done it in the past and this is a fairly substantial uh, change. So we do everything we can. And usually we know well in advance of when the service change, I mean like we're talking about August and it's only March. So we usually know well in advance of uh, the service change. So we have time to, to spread the information. Thank you. Okay, so next I'm gonna get pushy here because we're yeah. past uh, five. All right, uh, proposed pairing of the B43 bus stop. So if you could, yeah, progress the, and then up. <coughs> Uh, yeah, you get, if you go to the next one, it's fine. We so really don't want to miss this Bridge Street school stop <laughs> information, though. Can we uh, stop okay. here briefly? Sure. So there was a uh, request to mit, uh, move this uh, stop because of uh, congestion on uh, Bridge Street. Uh, and interestingly, the um, when we were looking at it and thinking of solutions, we thought, okay, let's just move it up to across from the <coughs> Northampton Post Office. Uh, this is the inbound stop um, because typically our stops are paired, but this the Northampton Post Office and this uh, stop on Bridge Street, neither of them have a pair. So that was the easy, elegant solution that I'm going to propose here today. And if you could move to the next slide, I can. Uh, so it's a little bit, uh, the resolution is not very good. So I'm gonna be Vanna for a second and point. Um, in the upper right hand corner, there's a, uh, there's a red. Oh, sorry, I have no idea what I did. <laughs> That's okay. If you just go back to the other uh, tab. Oh, hey, even better. I did that on purpose. Yeah, even better. So um, that is a, that, that like purple red uh, uh, pin. Yeah. That's where the stop currently is. We would propose to eliminate that stop thus getting rid of any problems having to do with traffic congestion during school, uh, pick up and drop off, and then moving it uh, southwest to um, where the green pin is um, across the street from the post office. And so if you progress the slide. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, this is the, uh, so this is that little shopping area. There's like, um, Oh, I'm trying to remember what stores are Tablets in there. Tablets and the baker's tin. There we go. Uh, it's about 90 feet of curb, of curb space between uh, driveways. Um, so that's plenty long for, as I was mentioning earlier, our articulated buses, which are 60 feet long. And then if you progress the slide one more, this would be uh, where we would propose installing the bus stop. Uh, one reason is in order to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act, we need to have an ADA landing pad that connects to the sidewalk. Um, so we don't, we certainly don't want to get rid of any trees, and we think that there's plenty of space there to install uh, the landing pad for people who have, you know, scooters and wheelchairs or uh, just, you know, need to use the, the ramp. It's, I would also note that it's already a no parking area, and it appears that there's plenty of um, pavement width uh, in terms of, you know, the bus being able to pull over and traffic still get by. I love this idea. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, yes, I'm oh, sorry, go on. Traffic does back up there a lot at that light. Is there a concern about when cars are backed way up there? I mean, I know that there's, they shouldn't be in that space, but. I don't know, Jamin? Uh, I would say the concern is that the bus is currently sitting in that traffic anyhow. Mm -hmm. So if traffic were to back up, it wouldn't be any different than what we're currently experiencing. Just instead of once traffic flows, continuing on through the light, we pull over and service the stop. So yeah. I, I love this as well. I'm just thinking about ADA, is that gonna meet side slope requirements? That's a steep slope there. Uh, that, it's it's not such a steep, uh, steep slope. Part of that is just an artifact of the camera angle. 
Um, it, it looks it looks like it falls away very quickly from the sidewalk, but it's a bit more level than that. Okay. It, it is a bit of a slope, yes. But, but you I look at it when you do the pad, you make sure it complies. Right. Yes. Yeah. The pad doesn't necessarily need to be level with the grass, so. And we would we would definitely work with the DPW and you know whatever other offices we need to work with in, in terms of installing this in a way that um, yeah works for ADA and works for the works for the city. Can I ask that's not related to this, but just while you're on this anyway? Mm -hmm. So I ride the B43 a lot, and I've noticed there, there's a, at least one spot in the university, and maybe multiple spots, where the bus stops and there's not a pad. So I know for new stops you have to bring it in. Is there any effort to go back in time and deal with those things? Yeah, we, uh, so, gosh, two summers ago, so not this last summer, but the summer before, I think, Time flies. We installed over 100 uh, ADA landing pads in Springfield at our uh, tier tier one um, route bus stops, and uh, we're going to continue applying for funding in order to do that. Um, we we have our, our uh, routes um, sort of ranked by highest ridership down to the lower ridership ones, and so we want to crank through all of our high ridership ones and then go to tier two, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Like a lot of legacy systems, it's hard. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Is that a standard thing to put a bus parking right in front of an entrance and exit to a parking lot? So visibility concern. We typically will keep the bus back at least 15 feet from the exit from the ramp or from the parking lot. So we would have to go back a little bit further than where that sign is. If you look at the, oh, uh, no, the slide you're on was good. Um, what I'd be recommending is if you can see where that sign post is on the picture, mm -hmm. and there's what looks like a newly planted tree, the pad would go in between there, and that would give us just about what we need. Mm -hmm. So the traffic exiting the parking lot would have a good sight line. Right. It, should, it might also be noted that you know the buses aren't going to be stuck in there for very long. This is typically just like the Bridge Street stop is now typically a drop-off point, so you don't have to worry about people fumbling for change or anything like that. People just could get off pretty straightforward, um, and that the bus traffic you know on the B43 is every 20 minutes. I think the 39 serves there as well, which is maybe every half hour, uh, about every half hour. Every half hour. So yeah. Um, so for most of an hour. There's there's no bus there in the first place, and you know suppose the car's trying to pull out of the parking lot and the bus is there. Worst case scenario, if the car is not sure about his visibility, he can wait a minute and then he'll be able to move again because the bus will be gone. How long are these buses? Sixty feet. Yeah, that's or a longer 60 one. Sixty feet are the longest ones. Yeah, yeah. the rest yeah, are 40, 40. forty feet typically. Sixty feet for the articulated. Yeah, I mean these are some of the details that we definitely <coughs> would want to work through with the city uh, to make sure that they're comfortable. This is just the initial proposal um, that I wanted to kick off and again make sure that there were no deep concerns <laughs> like no absolutely this won't work as a as a side note I know we'll need to update this city ordinance at some point and we need to have a conversation about other ordinance updates with our with our bus stop inventory um, but we don't have to dive into those details right now yeah it, so um, a few things so mm -hmm. first of all price thanks for bringing forward this proposal because um, we had talked about this and it's part of the ongoing uh, discussion topic a little later has to do with Bridge Street School um, that um, that director Lascalia actually and I looked at this on uh, the GIS system and that um, that the in the or the assessment of you know by looking at it on the computer rather than going out and actually measuring was that it looked like it was possible as a good location um, so um, uh, so I'm trying to imagine what the next step forward is here that um, that do we need some sort of resolution or, or some sort of request um, to move this forward or maybe you just want to have a discussion with DPW to one thing we could do in the interim because I mentioned there uh, we need to do some broader more global bus stop cleanup uh, one thing we could do in the interim is put in a temporary stop would that be doable 
I know that we're doing that in Chicopee. That's the that's the reason I bring it up. So take down the sign now, um, put up a temporary stop, um, and then work with the city council to clean up the ordinance, and then work with the DPW to do like the dig safe. Uh, we're not we don't have a concrete. Yeah, exactly. Knock on wood. Um, we don't have a concrete uh, uh, contractor right now. But it's out to bid at the moment, so we wouldn't be able to pour a pad um, until the summertime anyway. Um, but that would address the immediate concern of uh, you know moving the stop from this undesirable location, putting it as a temporary stop, and then uh, and then um, making it permanent uh, once we get the concrete pad poured and the ordinance passed, cleaned up. That would be my recommendation. So for the Main Street bus stop that was across from Bowen Park that we moved, PBTA had brought forward a proposal to TPC uh, with the measurements of where the new bus stop would go and then we discussed it from there. So if PBTA could bring forth the proposal and yeah. images. You know. But for okay. a temporary one, could they, they could do a temporary one in the meantime? I'm not sure if, the, if we've had temporary ones, how that process Right, and I would. And that would be putting a, a new sign in. So. And I think that'd be up to Director Lascali if we wanted to entertain that. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to suggest that you reach out. Your I I know from the email threads you, that the PVTA is already in conversation about straightening up. Um, the, the our, our ordinance mm -hmm. and where the bus stops are actually located all over the city that there's inconsistencies there right. and that dis, you know within that discussion um, that this uh, proposed stop could also be addressed and um, and uh, if uh, director Lascalio thinks it's a good idea to move forward you guys could come uh, develop a proposal and bring it back to us okay and then we'd have something to vote on Okay. Wayne? When you're done with this, I've something else before we lose Again? <laughs> so one, one <laughs> question is, in terms of process, so the this stop uh, uh, relocation would need to go through this commission, or if we wanted to update the ordinance globally across Northampton, that would have to go through this commission. They or both are confirmed. They both. You're okay. Right. Okay. All right. So then, um, I can be in touch with Director Lascalia to get her the information that she needs uh, in order to put forth that proposal and then we can come back. Right, and, and, and she'll be able to tell you whether or not she's comfortable doing a temporary stop, okay. which I, I just have this feeling she's not interested in doing that. Um, okay. um, but, um, but you guys can have that discussion and um, and then we can figure out a way forward around this. Okay, so it looks like I'm gonna be coming back in probably a month or two. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, the, this is good. I, I, I wanna thank all of you for coming today and also that as a uh, former member of the Public Transit Subcommittee that used to serve this committee in Subway several years back, that there was a, there was a steady relationship between um, uh, having public meetings with you know city meetings and with the PVTA and we got a lot of small details you know around all of these routes solved uh, on an ongoing basis so it's it's nice to have you guys back ah, well we're glad to be back always so, happy to come so two, oh you go ahead two quick things <laughs> just one about to stop again is a frequent b43 rider is often someone in a wheelchair getting out of the post office and so if it's going to be a temporary stop, be nice to check with drivers. You know, if that's a common occurrence, I need to create a temporary yeah. stop where you can't serve. And then nothing to do with this. So before she left, we had sort of a handshake agreement with Crystal about she had funding from somewhere for um, being able to provide some uh, bike uh, racks at bus stops. Mm -hmm. And so we worked out a deal with DPO who's going to issue the um, trench permits for no charge, and you guys were able to you guys <laughs> provide. The the bike racks and she left that didn't go anywhere. Is that still something you have funding for? And if so, can we bring that back to life? Uh, uh, this is maybe one step above my head. I will say conceptually we have funding every year for bus stop improvements. Um, in terms of 
funding, like what the status of that funding is, I have no idea. I'd have to ask the CFO. Okay. Um, but I can definitely check. check if that. there is, we we'd already identified the stops where there was enough concrete to add a concrete to add a, a bike rack. Okay. Great. Yeah, I can. I'll check in with the CFO and see what that see what that status is. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. That was that was very informative. Okay, now we're on to B, which we've actually already done, which is great. So now we can move on to item C, ordinance relative to bicycle, bicycle share services. Um, so, Wayne, could you give us like a quick 30 second, <coughs> one minute overview sure. and not discuss the B43? Yes. So if you've been to almost any medium to large U.S. city, or city anywhere in the world for that matter, in the last year, you can see the incredible proliferation of um, bike share and scooters that are just popping up all over the place. So there's a bunch of models, so both Uber and Lyft have bought out bike share and uh, uh, scooter shares. So if you have an Uber or Lyft app and you go to Denver, lots of cities, something pops up as with bike share. Um, and so it's becoming, you know, something we have to do. We, we haven't quite gotten into cities our size, but Lime has met with us and Amherst, and one of Lime's competitors, I forgot which, has met with Springfield. So they're clearly looking at the area. Um, and we're worried at two things. We're worried we have relatively narrow sidewalks compared to a lot of cities. And so the model of leaving your bikes on the sidewalk, which works in western cities with wide sidewalks, may not work in Northampton. Um, and then, frankly, we've spent $1.1 million in the Valley to create a Valley bike share system, and, and we do have some concerns about it being cannibalized. So our system, um, we don't mind competition generally, but our system, we specifically subsidize ridership for some low-income riders. We specifically have spots like on Pleasant Street and at, at Hampshire Heights that don't make sense financially, and we do it because we have a social equity piece. And so we're going to someone saying, we're just going to take the profit center. We know where the profit center is. Academy of Music turns out lots of use. All the downtown stations turn out lots of use. We know the ones we carry, sorry, but Lily Library is one of them, the ones that don't have enough use to justify, but we do it because we want to serve our community, um, and so we worry about it. So this is trying to address those things. So it's basically saying for bike share, you're welcome to come, but not in our central business district because you're not serving everybody. And for scooters, we don't want them yet. The time's going to come, right? This, this technology is evolving. Um, we know that they're also like, you know, um, there's a bike share program. One of these things was offered in Worcester for six months and they pulled out of Worcester because it didn't work. There's a bike share program in Hartford uh, just last year that pulled out of not working. So we want people who are gonna not destroy our bike share system and then flee. Um, and so it's everything from rules about not parking bikes on trees to the scooters and the bike share systems. Okay. And this is a lot to read, and I could read this into the record. Um, I, I'm trying to think best how to, uh, any ideas on best how to digest this other than reading it into the record? <laughs> we could really just do that with bold headings and then sort of just summarize quickly what each section is. If you okay. want to explore those, we can see Okay. Um, so let's do that. Um, so, uh, uh, proposed ordinance are 19.011, an ordinance relative to bicycle share services. Um, so, um, the uh, first section here uh, uh, works, uh, has some definitions. We have shared mobility device, which is a um, a human-powered low-speed electric vehicle. So basically, it's a power assist bike. Is that right, Wayne? Yes. The, w w there's a, s a specific federal definition that fits into. I think it's half horsepower. Can't go above. I think it's 12 miles per hour. So we're talking about low speed. These are not scooters. You know, gas scooters or, or high speed things. Uh, but it Wayne, it includes um, it includes bicycles and scooters. So uh, that's the distinction I would want in that definition. Yes, I think it may be elsewhere we break it down, or elsewhere in our, our zoning, and we already have that under 
some of the language where we allow things. Yeah, so we already have some standards in 312-78 in terms of what we allow. So we'll come back to that later on. Keep that in the back of your mind. All right, keep going? Yeah. Okay. Uh, shared mobility device program. Uh, so it's um, how such services are provided. Uh, landscape furniture zone. Uh, that is that area of the public way uh, in central business. It's the bricked area. Um, uh, bicycle parking in uh, the public way. There's a um, uh, uh, language here uh, that describing the different features around the public way and how uh, such vehicles can be parked. Um, and uh, with the goal of uh, p pedestrians be able to pass uh, without uh, being impeded by parked vehicles. Um, shared mobility device programs. Uh, talks about a permitting process, an application. Um, uh, section C talks about a service area. Um, and, um, and, it, and how this uh, service can only be in the central business district. Outside the central district. Outside, outside the... So our model, our ideal model, I'm not sure anybody would want it, is a feeder system. You know, how do you get lower cost things that might be, you know, we're in Florence and we're in downtown, right. but how do you get people who want to serve Leeds and want to serve co-housing projects and want to serve the western part of the city? Now, if we could get people who wanted to be there, that'd be great. The reality is they all want to be downtown. Uh, section D, um, fleet parking and stations. Uh, describes how the fleet parking, and this has mostly has to do with when they have parkings in a public space, not in a private space. Right, private space, and then you go. Yeah. Uh, pedal assist electric specifications talks about how um, there is governors on these vehicles to uh, keep them uh, moving at a not too rapid. So this is to Devin's point. This is about so in that section three twelve. <coughs> That's the thing about speed limits and about uh, citing the federal law that we don't want. These are not the high-speed devices that are out there. But uh, since it doesn't say anywhere that they can't run on gas, is that something that should be added? I think it does in 312.78. Okay. Fine. So again, that's for, that's for paths, not for anything else. But okay. Because if you want to go in the street, you have the right to be. You know, if you go in the street, you're meeting whatever mass stop, what, whatever the state requirements are. Okay. It's the things that we regulate in addition to the street sidewalks and height uh, Section F speaks to signage and advertising. Uh, section G speaks to safety and maintenance. Um, citing some U.S. requirements and then a whole list of things. Um, can you summarize that, Wayne? Yeah, so it's everything from, we wanted to notify you, you know, we know that people are, scooter riders are very rarely using helmets, and bike share riders are still less likely to use helmets than people on private bikes. We're not mandating that, but at least we're wanting people to warn people of that. We're, we're setting the rules, we're giving us the right to grab the bikes um, or the scooters when they're not meeting the rules. So usually we keep them out for a long time in the street. Um, but this sort of says specifically you're abiding this, we can impound vehicles and some permit system so that we can track where these things are. Uh, Section H, ex Equitable SMD Program. Um, I mean, you're on a roll, keep going. So again, same concept, if, if the public system, Valley Bike, is specifically spending a lot of its money to serve underserved populations, we think it's fair that other people coming in shouldn't just take advantage of people who can afford to pay a dollar an hour or whatever the rates are. That they should also be serving foreign types and should also be serving products. So we're giving them a certain mandate to serve that just as we do with Valley Bank. Okay. Uh, section I has to in do with insurance and indemnity requirements of a million dollars and uh, two million dollars total. And Section J has to do with reporting, um, how uh, 
you know how a the, the uh, if there's if a customer has an issue or uh, citizens have an issue with the system how that gets reported um, 25-12b amended by adding all right what is this so these are existing rules there's nothing with bike share general these are just existing rules we have we've had a rule for years that you're you're not allowed to ride on the central business district and the general business district but you are allowed to ride elsewhere the office industrial district for many people is indistinguishable from the general business district it's you know it's a more urban area we don't want to be on meadows north meadow street i mean north maple street for example um, suddenly switch from GB to office industrial. It's the same urban area. It's not a right place to write the sidewalks that are out there. So basically that's what we're doing is adding the sidewalks. The one exception, um, and we went through this last year with DPW when we added the bike share facility in, in Pulaski Park, is we expect people in the bike share facility to go through Pulaski Park to get down to the bike path. So we're saying, you know, generally should be riding in, in a park, but Pulaski Park going down the, that connection is legit. Okay, thank you. So I realized uh, as we come to the point of discussing this, we haven't had a motion to put this on the floor. <coughs> so would somebody like to make a motion? Move a positive recommendation. Second. Okay. Any discussion? It's the devil in the details. I think there are a lot of cities that are really frustrated with lines. I mean, I've been traveling in the front wheel locking up is no small issue with them right now. So I think that we ought to have something in place. I don't know that I know enough to vote on it at the moment. That's my problem, not yours. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need it. I applaud you doing it. And yes, I really don't want someone coming in and cherry picking the, the heart of the, you know, the density out of the city with a really jazzy non-business viable system you know and that is likely what will happen from what i've seen um are you expecting us to vote on accepting this today i'm hoping uh, no crisis but you know we're, we, the system starts april first so we just work me having had these conversations with some of the vendors we know they're looking so now let me just reveal that i was not at the bike head meeting in February? Has it been through that committee? Not in detail, no. This has been vetted. The process for this has been a little bit different. So we have six communities in our Valley Bike Consortium. And every town's not going to have the same regulation. Some towns aren't going to do anything. But we've been going using that as a process to sort of encourage it so that Springfield, Amherst, and East Hampton are at least looking at this case. So that's really been our working group. So I, I want to give Wayne credit for having that committee and for getting up and getting a viable group together. But I also want to, on the flip side of that, say this is exactly the kind of work that committee should get to first and, and iron out before it comes here. Um, so I, I, I'm torn about the schedule. Um, is, is there a timeline with this, Wayne? The problem is we just don't know. The problem is, you know, these, these companies are clearly looking. They, they've now been, as in, one's looked at Northern Hampshire County and one's looked at, at Springfield. We just don't know when they show up or not. So maybe nothing would happen if we did nothing, but we had, we worry about waking up one morning and finding these things out there. Right. right. So it's just, some cities have done that. They, you know, they've woken up. Denver um, literally woke up, and Denver doesn't allow them in bike lanes. So suddenly Denver, the only legal way to ride your scooters is going down the sidewalks. Um, yeah, so we just deal with it. So, it's, so, the end, we don't so let me try a different tack on this. Um, I, I'm like Wayne, I very much worry because this is a competitive horse race business right now. How many scooters you can get out and planted around towns is, is what they're about. Um, is there something in our structure that says we have to agree to it before it can be planted on public way? In other words, how does a town go about preventing that unintended entry? And is this what you see as our way to do that? Is what we said, yes. Okay. Well, wait, is this like zoning where they show, if they show up and start doing business, they'd be grandfathered in? No, if it's in a public way, we probably could do something after the fact. So you're right. I mean, if they, if they show up, it, it becomes harder politically, but no, I mean, so they would, the property. Risk, uh, it would be their risk that right. 
that the yeah. right. I mean, San Francisco, for example, the, the two companies that came into San Francisco before with any permission were banned. So San Francisco kicked them out. Then they did a moratorium. They passed new regulations, and when they licensed new companies, they specifically refused to license the two companies who came in without permission hmm. to punish them. <laughs> to take out business permits to do business in a municipality of some sort. You can't just show up. If you're incorporated, you don't need to. Well, I mean, there's either, you know, PD-related regulations, DPW-related. You need to check well, somewhere. So yeah, I can remember can't when, just we, when we considered pedicab licenses. I was going to say the cabs. Or you know, and so there, there is a way of using the public way for private gain. Right. But on the other hand, a three-wheeled electric umbrella covered thing can ride on my streets it's not illegal golf carts you know I mean so I think there's that gray area I'm I, I want this in I just don't I would have to say to you I'm I haven't put my time in on it yet but that's my confession I, I'd love to think we do need we do need what Wayne is bringing right. forward to us so Wayne, the, the other five members of the consortium, where are they at as far as vetting this? Thing? They're all in different places. I don't know the answer. I mean, you know, we've met as a committee, and they take it back to their own towns. And at that point, I'm not involved, so I don't know what's what's going on in their towns. Is so? Is there any reason that this can't be brought forward, and then at some point in the future amended? Yeah, it's like any ordinance. It's yeah, like any ordinance. Any so the way I look at it is that if, if we bring it forward and we vote on it to move it forward, it can still, other people within the municipality can still have their say. So that opportunity is not lost. I don't, I don't see that opportunity as lost. The other thing is that this is probably much better than nothing if something does happen, right? So. I think that a prospective scooter vendor would look at this and say, that's kind of a bag of worms that I don't want to get into. Like, I'll just go to Amherst or whatever. So, um, I, you know, I, I look at this saying, we're not really losing anything because other people, if they want to say in the process, can still have the same process, like my dad or really anybody else. So. I, I read through this um, when it was sent to me, and I didn't really quite understand it. But um, now that I'm on this side of it, I kind of have a sense that it really would make it harder, much harder, for anybody to move forward with a invading Northampton with their scooters. So I, I would say, you know, vote on it and put it out there and get it in place. Because if they do come, it's going to be costly and a pain to get them out. It, it's just so much easier to, to keep them out in the first place. And even if this isn't perfect, we can still fix it up. Councilor sure. So from here, it needs to go to legislative matters. So, Devin, that could also be another opportunity for you to weigh in, weigh in there. Yeah. And then it goes to council for two readings, so. Yeah, I'm fine with you, Ken. I, um, I'm not sure I don't want them. I'm just sure I want some structure to them, so. Okay. Incidentally, I, I hope this isn't become not voting, but our bike committee group meets tomorrow. So, we can certainly talk about it tomorrow. Again, I hope you guys make a recommendation now, but we can catch up with the legislative matters. Yeah, I think that would that would be in concert with what we would do that would then be a two-point opinion that goes forward. Well, I, I want to say that that's how I was approaching this, <coughs> that in terms of there's so much going on here because it's, you know, a mixture of ordinance, you know, and what we're gonna, how we're going to enforce the, the sidewalks, the zoning piece, and just in terms of, you know, transportation, I think that you know that I'm comfortable with the transportation piece sending this forward and then you know is this enough insurance that's something that can come up at legislative matters 
it can be discussed at council you know details like that so um and and wayne this can be discussed at bike and pet yeah, yeah okay but again they haven't seen it ahead of time so they're not necessarily going to come tell them i mean the emails from tonight but they're not most of them aren't going to study ahead of time but okay. at least we certainly talk about it tomorrow Wayne, has Alan Sewald seen it? Uh, yes, that's been one of the, so there's actually a version we introduced in council in December, right, and then Alan asked for some changes, right. um, and that's sort of what's delayed the process, but this is now inside all. Okay, because he weighed in on insurance, what we talked about taxes, one of the times. Right. Any more discussion? So on the floor is to send this forward with a positive recommendation, uh, back to City Council, which will then uh, be um, sending it to legislative matters. So it would go back. Let's see, would it be on this council? No, it wouldn't be on this council's agenda. So there, it's actually slowed up a bit because of the timing of the meetings. So um, with that in mind, uh, so uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, next, and we're getting there. Oh, my agenda go. Oh, man. Where did it go? Oh. Neta traffic and parking updates. Um, uh, Nancy, I think, um, and, and Chief Casper, do you have anything to report on? How things are going with NETA? Uh, so there was some concern from uh, the Pleasant Street during used cars down there that people couldn't access their lot and some of the customers from NETA were driving through their lot. So um, this week we made the adjustment that Fulton is open. So the street is open. Uh, it's just we've, re we've moved our officers to other areas to try to help cars get in and out. To the foot traffic and the number of visitors to the establishment has remained pretty steady. We thought it would drop off more after the holidays, but it has not. And actually, as the weather's warmer, um, it's it's up uh, from our visual observations. I don't know what's in our cash registers, but uh, it's nice warm weather out there. And um, there's a big event coming up. Strap Bench is going to be happening on April 20th. Uh, so I'm quite sure that. Uh, that we'll have a lot of traffic down there for that. We're anticipating a pretty difficult uh, traffic day on that day. Uh, but overall, I think the general flow is moving smoothly. The officers are doing a great job getting cars through there. I haven't heard as many complaints about um, from nearby businesses that are having problems with people parking in there and towing. I haven't heard any of that in months. And it's, I don't know if you've heard anything different. So it's really just a matter of managing the traffic in and out. And the, the parking on Pleasant Street that was a problem, it was hard to pull out. Um, that's been mitigated with the cones and it's been fine. We continue to have accidents around there, minor fender benders. Let's uh, see, update on that. Chief, are you still keeping Fulton as one way westbound? One way, yeah. Is there any desire to make that permanent? Like to do an ordinance to make it a one way street? I spoke with Director Lascali about it. I think we're both hesitant to do anything until kind of the dust settles with uh, the adult use. Um, you know, across the state. We just don't know what it's going to look like. We don't want to make a change now and then in a year when we have, you know, the customer base is kind of spread out more yeah, over yeah. the state um, to then have a one-way road that we don't really need. So. Certainly, it's, even in Norinetta, it's a horrible left turn to make onto Pleasant Street. Now, that's the appeal of Netta, of, of Fulton being one way anyway. But there's no hurry, I guess. Yeah, and we've talked about no left turn at the, oh, okay. you know, kind of forcing people to go out and take the right. But. I think there's, we're hesitant to do anything. We looked at Wright Avenue as well, um, but just waiting to see how things are at the end of the summer and maybe reevaluating at that time to see how things are going. Do, do we have any estimates for when other recreational ones will open up? In our community, no, I don't have any dates. I, I have a lot of meetings with people who are asking questions about opening up different sorts of establishments, be it just production only or you know other sorts of things. but. Um, no dates on anything, so there's a lot of people I think exploring and then uh, not opening yet. Is Extrema Ganja going to be at the fairgrounds? I haven't seen the signed contract yet, so we're, I think we're in the midst of settling those details. I have a planning meeting on Thursday. I think we'll know more 
but that's where it's, if it happens here, that's where it will be. Right, I thought there was a question that maybe it would not be happening here. Yeah, that was up in the air for a while, but I believe now, I, like I said, I haven't seen the signed contract, but I believe it's getting signed. So, I've seen it advertised on Facebook for the fair <laughs> Uh, the one detail I know of from contact with the director of the fairgrounds is they're doing online ticketing so that um, and that you can get I don't I'm not sure if they're charging for these tickets or but the, the ticketing will end the Friday night before the event on the Sunday and if you don't have a ticket you can't get in so yeah we asked them to do that they were anticipating a really large crowd this year 20 or 25,000 people and we just that, those streets can't handle that 91 can't handle it the bridge can't handle it it's too much we can when we have 15,000 people which is what we've had historically at that, that event it's too much traffic for that area in a really short time you know we have maybe that many people on a really good fair day but it's spread over like you know very early in the morning to you know 11 o'clock at night this event is only six hours so and people want to get there at the beginning so it's this huge influx so we asked them to do that and then hopefully and we'll have less people showing up for hoping to just get in at the last minute. We'll see how that works out. But traffic's always a challenge around that event. Well, we got off topic. All right, good. That was you. That was you. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's still within the realm of this. All right. I, I, I see the light at the end of the tunnel here. The, the rest is going to go pretty quickly here. Um, we have the ordinance uh, relative to parking on Main Street in Florence. Um, this has to do with, um, uh, Rich Cooper was here a few months ago uh, and, ta and talked about, um, he requested some 15 minute spaces in front of Cooper's Corners. Uh, 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 DPW has drafted a proposal <coughs> that has two 15 minute parking spaces. Um, that has been shared with both Councillor Murphy and with Rich Cooper, and they're both fine with it and pleased with it. And um, so this is the recommendation from DPW and the councillor and the uh, constituent who's interested in seeing this change are all happy with this proposal. Um, would somebody like to make a motion? So moved. Second. And this is a motion to send this forward to council with a positive recommendation. Oh. So we can see what we're looking at. You're so good at this. I know. <laughs> you keep getting better. Okay. Yeah, so from this map, so this I'll go to the bottom one. Photos. That's where, yeah. So on this map, it's the two spaces closest to the intersection uh, abutting Cooper's that are have been selected uh, been chosen for the 15 minute spots and and um, I think Ms. Chan can speak to why those two spaces rather than farther down the line. It seems like it would be easier to just pull in rather than back up. I mean most people who are parking there are used to doing the parallel parking anyway but having the two spaces closer to the intersection would also serve as a Right. Just to the point earlier from public comment, this map, I mean, you are correct. That's, you can't park, it, it says green, which is limited time parking, but you can't park where there's a curb cut for the entrance. And you can't park how many feet from an intersection? 20 feet from the intersection. Right, so, so you are correct, it's an incorrect map. Yeah. Any more discussion? Okay, all in favor of sending this forward with a positive recommendation, say aye. 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 Any no's? Any abstentions? Okay, on to the next thing. Um, all right, this, uh, we're gonna go through this quick. Um, I wanted to provide the, the commission with an update on a number of things here because there was things that the commission approved, went on to council, there was discussion <coughs> with neighbors, and um, so um, the first one had to do with a 15-minute parking space on Union Street. Um, I moved, uh, that went to council, and uh, before it went to second reading, there was some pushback from some of the neighbors there, and there, the question was, why are we putting a 15-minute space here on Union Street when there's short-term parking available right in the schoolyard 
that is being taken by staff. I went back to the to the school and the school uh, uh, the principal uh, looked at that situation and uh, because of the changes in programming at Bridge Street School that those spaces could actually be once again be made available for parents to do the pickup drop-off so that I've been told those spaces are now available so for second reading and I'm, get, I'm getting good at this asking people to vote down my uh, <laughs> legislation and so uh, so that was voted down but we actually got a positive res uh, uh, resolution to the situation for that particular situation um, you just heard about reloading locating the the bus stop at Lampern Park um, and in here um, uh, director Lascalia wanted to make sure that uh, people saw this that um, and, and this kind of speaks to why I think she's not going to be fond of a temporary uh, bus stop that she likes she wants things in ordinance very clear and that what's going on here at this particular bus stop is that it's not in in city ordinance and so the bus stop by Lampert Park is technically illegal right now so what we're doing is we're providing by working to pair the bus stops we're looking for a legal space for that westbound stop to be um, uh, through some um, uh, um, communications with Ms. Chan, we discovered there was an erroneous no parking sign that was on Bridge Street near the cemetery and that um, DPW's gone out and had that removed. So that was deterring some parents from also parking there. Um, and the, the last thing is that um, Councillor Cher and I have heard from a number of parents that we, that the next thing we really want to start talking about is what's going on on Parson Street because that's where we get a lot of the uh, illegal uh, stopping. Um, we're trying to, as you can see, we're trying to create spaces for parents to legally park and bring their children to the school. Here what's going on is we have a lot of illegal stuff and it, there's kind of, there's a side of the street where it's clearly illegal and everybody kind of knows it and does it. But then there's the other side that's already been kind of been tolerated for many years, which is on the Lampard Park side. And so, um, Councillor Sharon and I have reached out to the mayor to talk with both the chief and the, our parking uh, uh, um, administrator. And, um, and so we're gonna come up with a plan at some point over the next few months. Does this include the long-standing issue of the bus drop off and pick up circle that's always been a notorious issue at Bridge Street. It's part of the discussion, right. but I don't think right. any plan it still is, is in the mix. It's hard to talk it's about that without talking about the loop. Right, it's, yeah. it's, but it, it should all be on the table yeah. because it's, you know, to address the other issues and then not talk about is there even an option for the bus without discussing what those issues are. Yeah, if you it's have any ideas, issue. we'd love to hear them. I think no one can come up with a solution for the loop aspect of it. Right, but and we've looked at this. Yeah. Brochure design has looked at it. I mean, it's just so don't don't take that off and look at it. It's just a vehicle problem. And forget the buses. And actually, the main we should know the main one of the main reasons we're having this discussion, although it's we all recognize it's a perpetual discussion, but it's really urgent. Is that there have been two small accidents involving buses involving the buses um, trying to pull out one pulling onto bridge and one pulling out of the loop by the loop so that's what yeah. right. you. you're welcome to join that conversation yes yeah. we'll see i'll we'll loop you in on whatever <coughs> we're meeting and you may that's appear fine. right I mean, tony and i even before tony came here tony and i have been manning these meetings so yeah, yeah. so okay so that's what's going on with uh, item G, update on an ordinance relative to handicapped parking space on Pleasant Street. So um, what came before the committee here was a um, the proposal to put a handicapped parking space on Pleasant Street in front of Millennium Liquors. Um, I, you know, I did not extend the courtesy to myself that I extend to like Councillor Murphy and other councillors who uh, brought forward things and um, I didn't go out and talk to my constituents first when I did I got pushback from both Roberto's and Millennium Liquors 
for having it at that location and they were agreeable to having it on the other side of the intersection of Kingsley right by Roberto's um, and um, in discussions with uh, director Lascalia uh, the DPW uh, per their um, assessment of things they can't recommend a handicapped sp uh, space near a raised crosswalk well we decided to throw that impasse out to uh, the Commission on Disabilities and let them figure out what we should do here so that's actually being it might have already been decided on it's been over at Commission on Disabilities today where they've been out to the site to look at it they've looked at the the proposed ordinance and in the different uh, spaces and um, and that uh, uh, I've told as the Ward 3 counselor and to Director Lestalia said whatever they come up with we're we're, we're both going to go with because they're the experts here so um, so we'll probably that'll probably be coming back to us next month to then send forward to to council um, so new business any new business um, I just have two real quick things to mention here uh, one next month's TPC is during school break um, I, I know the counselor Shara is expecting to be out of town is everybody else expecting to be around I'm out of town as well you're out of town as well um, what's the date it oh, is yeah. the 16th April 16th can't be here that's three. Do we got a quorum? I think we're still good. Um, if people could go, you know, uh, within the next few days, check your planners um, and um, uh, let me know uh, so we can let people know ahead of time whether or not we have a quorum. Right now it looks like we do. Um, and then the last thing, all right, um, so next month, uh, next month we'll feature a report on trains coming to the valley we have some changes going on uh, with the um, the trains coming from Greenfield they're going to be going to Springfield and then down to uh, Hartford and this is my whistle from the uh, the, the uh, high-speed rail committee so I'm gonna <laughs> so that'll be next month anything else move to adjourn yeah. We'll go over to <laughs> All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you everybody.